Ukraine's diaspora of professionals and refugees are playing an extraordinary part in supporting Ukraine, but so too are volunteers and civic society within the country. Today, we're going to be discussing how that has evolved through the war uh, and what the various types of volunteer organizations are, what role they are fighting in making Ukraine resilient and helping to win the struggle against Russian aggression. We'll be speaking with Julia Timoshenko, who is fighting for Ukraine on the information front, running marketing communications for St. Javelin and as editor-in-chief at Ukraine. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. If you enjoy the material we create, please like and subscribe to help boost the popularity and, of course, help new people discover our fantastic speakers. Julia, I hope that introduction, that's the introduction pretty much from the last conversation we had. I hope those details are all still correct. Almost. I'm I'm doing more now project based work with Ukrainer because I've I'm pretty busy with a lot of things going on with Sin Javelin, but I'm still editing. I'm actually currently editing a translation of um, a book about the occupation uh, of Ukrainian territories that is uh, based on a lot of interviews, testimonies, and the trips of Ukrainer to uh, the occupied territories, almost following immediately following the liberation of those places and just like pretty mind, much mind-blowing accounts of what the Russian occupation and Russian world means for for everyone but for Ukrainians specifically and um, yeah and so I'm, I'm doing a lot of different things I've actually started interviewing as well <laughs> for Ukrainer in English channel so if people are interested in that check it out um, I think we might have even like have some some more guests, but definitely different, uh, different maybe conversations. So yeah, thank you so much for inviting me again. Really pleasure to speak here. No, it, it's a fantastic privilege to speak to you. And I think for me, some of the most interesting conversations are the ones with people who have direct experience, firsthand experience on the ground those who have spoken to people either involved in civic society uh, or directly on the front. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned, there are people who are under occupation. That uh, we're gonna we're gonna largely discuss, you know, this this resilience, civic society, war fatigue. Is it a real concept? But let's start with the deoccupied territories, because that is an area which, like the stolen children doesn't get nearly enough coverage given the sheer horror uh, of those two angles to the war so could you describe your activity and what some of the experiences insights are like that have emerged from uh from doing these interviews um i i want to preface that like i haven't went to the majority of because Ukraine actually managed to deoccupy a lot of a lot of territories and we know how successful the Kharkiv counteroffensive was last year. Kherson liberation, obviously the north and Kiev. I've um, I have a direct experience because my hometown was occupied and my dad and my grandparents spent a month under Russian occupation and. I think obviously that's not a, a way to describe privilege, but I do feel privileged that it was only a month and not um, like some of these people already uh, been there for like a year and a half or more. And obviously, I don't know how their family and friends and how they're feeling. It's totally horrific. And from a personal account, I know what's, what it's like to have Russian tanks rolling and Russian soldiers going around and like looking either for pretty girls because why would they be looking for pretty girls in villages and towns while they're trying to fight or uh, basically torturing people who volunteer to help each other. So in the village nearby where I went to school in Kiev region, I think they, they found out that one man was fixing el electricity. And it's actually very interesting because in my village, my dad and other group of men they sort of like self-organized and decided to fill, fix the electricity just to keep the village at least to like some power because like gas and other like things were already uh, disconnected. But in the village nearby, when the Russians were like stationed longer, um, they found out who was doing that. Then they basically tortured the person 
and like beat them up. Uh, I, I'm actually not sure if he survived or not because I know that there were several cases as well of people being found in like cellars, like um, beaten up to death with like signs of obviously very, very, very violent death. So all of that is a reality. As I said, like in my case, it was only a month. I was very lucky that my family was okay and like never came in contact with the Russians. Although other villagers, uh, the people that I know personally did. Um, but I was really, really scared that they're going to start going house to house because when they do, you don't know what they like. They just might might kill you because they they see any association with Ukrainian Nazis, which is literally like they were actually my classmate. They unstripped him to see if there is any tattoos that like refer to Ukraine in any way. And obviously he doesn't have them, but uh, yeah, they just, he was just like walking on the street. So um, it's some, then there are cases obviously where, <laughs> sorry, where the Russian stayed for longer, such as Kherson. And that's specifically like what I mentioned in the book that I'm currently editing. And it's my friend Bogdan from Ukrainer. He's the founder of Ukrainer who went to all of those territories. And actually it's something that you can watch on um, in English YouTube channel of Ukrainer we managed to dub and translate to English, I think around like six or five episodes of the occupation from different towns. And uh, you can learn and hear from people firsthand what, what it was like to, to live, resist, try to survive merely as like a community, as like people, family during that horror. And um, there is nothing pleasant, I can tell you for sure. Um, it makes a big impression, doesn't it? It's um, whether it's six months or more or just a month or even a few days, it leaves lifelong traces. It can change someone's entire outlook. Two of the guests on the channel, uh, Jana Rodienka, who is now in um, the Netherlands, and uh, Aksana Seminik, who um, is uh, you know a well-known art historian, uh, both survived in Salas under occupation. Both would have stories uh, of, uh, you know, the neighboring building, the neighboring cellar where people did not survive and where they were tortured. And it just seems to be uh, an extraordinary luck. You know, it's like someone involved in a, an airplane accident or something. Your survival is based on pure luck. But the yeah. trauma of that is going to remain uh, for, for life. Forever. And it will change the way you see the world. And um, I am, I'm very amazed by people who are very openly speak about their traumatic experience. There's uh, most of them actually want to share and when they want to talk and describe. And I remember specifically, I think like reading and editing the story from Izum and reading about specific torture chambers in Izum and how they were torturing with the the um, electrocution and like wires and um, something like similar to kind of like waterboarding. Um, and then for me personally, as a woman, obviously it's like the hardest to hear stories of rape or any kind of sexual violence. And uh, that was just like completely chilling because I think like one man was telling how he was in the, in the room with like a few other men, like in the um, uh, captivity room. And uh, he didn't know what, what were the other people there. Like he knew that there were other people because like he could hear them taking, bringing people in and out, taking people from his room and he that didn't know what was happening to them. But he said that there were like certain hours where you could hear that they would go to women and you could hear the screams uh, and you could hear how they were, were like talking about the women. He was like, oh, like this woman, she doesn't want to like, she doesn't want to give me a head. So like, just whatever, like, um yeah like 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 do like finish off finish her off or something like this and um yeah it's like completely horrific because like it, it is it is pure luck almost like 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 when you end up to in that situation or not like even even thinking about my choices on like the february february 25th um my dad was really really asking me not to go to my village Although my grandparents like, no, no, like come here. We're like, we're going to be fine, safe. It's like away from Kiev. But like, I think like both me and my dad, we had a sense that they're going to be there. And it's a conversation that I remember us having in January when we were sort of imagining. Um, and he said to me very specifically, like, if they come, I 
like it would be the scariest part would be if you would be here as well like because then you would have to like hide or something and I I, I understood what he was implying and in that mo moment like obviously kind of like my heart dropped to my <laughs> stomach uh but it was still kind of imaginary I mean obviously I knew that from history it's something that they do all the time but obviously then we started uncovering territories that were occupied and seeing what they were doing to everybody and I've spoken to people who because this is the 21st century because the Soviet Union ended because there was a period of uh relative freedom in the 90s I think some people didn't think that this age-old Russian behavior let's even call it a strategy because it's clearly a strategy some people did not believe that that is how it would pan out some people of course and I specifically people I think uh, as you go further east whose first language may be Russian may also have believed that in some ways um, that would have provided some kind of protection. It's quite clear, isn't it, now that they treat people who are Ukrainian, whether they are Russian speakers or not, uh, pretty much the same with suspicion and contempt. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's um, I, I, it's really funny that Putin, that tells the world that he started all of this to protect the Russian speakers has been killing mostly the Russian speakers of Ukraine. Like, because the majority of victims, if you think about Mariupol, if you think about currently occupied territories and like everything that's happening there, like majority of them were Russian speakers, Ukrainian, Russian speaking Ukrainians, doesn't mean that they were pro Russian. That's something that Putin wants you to believe. Um, I have family and friends, I mean, like all of us, like, have stories of like Russification and how that was opposed on us that doesn't mean that our identity was like oh we're Russian I mean like I don't have to tell it to people who's from the UK that not everybody who speaks English is probably a person from England so um but it is fascinating that people completely seem to ignore that those who specifically believe in this idea like but no like there's this like russian speaking issue and like putin he was like always trying to protect like yeah by like killing and erasing to the ground the cities that are primarily russian speaking in ukraine yeah and what's also become apparent although i think the the full scale of it is not going to be understood until all the territories are liberated there has also been an attempt by Russia to import um, their native population uh, to replace the local population. That is perhaps nowhere clearer than Crimea, and there's been a much longer for them to do this in Crimea. And of course, there's a long history of that happening. But this, again, is another pattern from history, isn't it? Um, uh, replacement of the Ukrainian population by uh Russian speakers, or not Russian speakers, native native Russians, potentially sort of workers, provincial people. Um, and that further reinforces the lie um, that uh, that these towns are, are Russian, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think it's a, there is a term to describe this, uh, settler colonialism. It's uh, been, it has been practiced by, by a lot of colonial powers in the world and is currently also um, taking place in many places, not just Ukraine, but Russia has always been using that as a way to claim the land. Obviously, we know about the mass deportation during Soviet Union, when Soviet Union would deport um, indigenous population of like territory, the whole territory, such as Crimea, um, and then replace it uh, artificially with the Russians. Like it would give Russian military servicemen like houses there for like their service in the second world war or like uh just presented to russians as this beautiful place to go and like buy yourself a beach house well that beach house used to belong to a crimean tatar family that you know worked there lived there their entire life but then were deported or killed uh in, in a matter of fact so and currently it's the same it's the same method being applied to unfortunately currently occupied Ukrainian territories, like the ones that were freshly occupied from 2022, because obviously there, there's been those that occupied since 2014, and that, that kind of settler colonialism has been happening there since, since then. 
but right now, um, it's also like really important to know that it's not just the Russian uh, Kremlin's policy to do that. Like, obviously, they do encourage that. I think, like, um, I think Putin, when um, the Crimean Bridge was blown off uh, this last summer, like, like, like this year, maybe. Um, he suggested that people travel to Crimea, not through the bridge, but through Mariupol and the south of Ukraine, which like really tells you how much he cares about the people, because there's literally a front line just a few miles away from there. But he really wants them to still go because it's it's it, it is their policy. But the Russians themselves, they also really don't see any problem with that with that, because this imperialist mindset is instilled i mean like they're they're just so used to it it's i remember like seeing telegram chats or posts on social media from the russians saying like oh i'm thinking of buying an apartment in mariupol because the property is cheap there uh the uh, you know the sea is right there it's like a nice town they don't even talk about the fact that there was a full-on genocide of like tens of thousands of people like that the situation in Mariupol was I mean it's still horrific because like those people like I know that Russia shows off to the world that it built like few residential houses where they go and build and uh, film their propaganda videos and like one school after erasing like like almost the entire city I think like there was like statistics that almost every single building was like hit and just the fact that my favorite saying, like ordinary Russians, ordinary Russians don't consider that. They're just like, well, cheap property, great. Like, you know, I'm gonna move there with my family maybe. Um, that just tells us again that the complicity of Russian society in this is is huge. And it's something that I know in the West, people don't like to talk about, but it's something that is key to understand when we understand Ukraine and Russia. And it's not it's not new, and it and it predates Putin. If people are trying to put a label on it and saying, "Ah, oh, well, you know, it's just the current elite," I remember um, traveling around the uh, Karelia uh, Peninsula in the nineties, and of course, that territory, that entire territory, used to belong to Finland, and there are still signs, especially in the in the in the large town. I think it was uh, Finland's third largest town that was uh, taken over by Russia, and it it doesn't feel Russian. And it quite clearly uh, was a vibrant city up until it was taken over by Russia. It was quite clearly vibrant, you know, through the 20s, 30s, you had uh, Art Nouveau buildings, you had uh, what was clearly a very sophisticated city, which essentially was then turned into a village overnight when the Russians took it over. And that's an odd feeling, I guess, maybe because I'm from Britain, I'm an island. Um, it's been a long time since, uh, you know, Britain was occupied. And even then, as an island, you don't get that sense of shifting borders and land once belonging to somebody else and all those people having been moved out. And I remember having a conversation with a, with a family there and um, there's to total indifference to the idea. And you even raise the question, like, you know, doesn't it feel odd that, uh, that this this place clearly was Finnish and was such a, an intrinsic part of Finnish history. All you get is like, a, well, it's ours now, you know. Yep. Uh, no one cares. I think I recently saw this uh, Russian YouTuber. It some, somehow it popped up recommended. I, I hate when YouTube or Google recommend me any Russian content. Unfortunately, it's still happening. Um, and uh, he's actually, uh, he presents himself as like a position against Putin, you know, like one of those who lives in Europe. Um, I think he's actually in the UK because I think Ukrainian activists confronted him in, in the UK. He uh -huh. like, he asked him, he asked him on the street to like ask if he condemns Putin. And he was like, why should I say that? What's um, his name? What uh, are you going to Var Varlamov? Something oh, Ilya Velamov. Like... Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but like I, I think it's like I didn't like watch the video, but I think he posted something recently with like Alaska, the most Russian state in the US. And I'm like, of course, of course, this is how you frame it. Of course, this is how you see it. So um I just I, I mean that's why like we largely in Ukraine um don't like trust Russian opposition. Um 
or like so-called opposition because we actually i mean i personally don't believe there's any like mobilized true opposition there because most likely they're just gonna uh, repackage and promote the same kind of imperialistic ideas but just with this idea of like no we're the good ones because we're against putin but we're not against russian imperialism Deep well this is yeah. This is an interesting question. I mean, I, I've, I've watched a lot of alarmist material, and uh, I think the the strange irony is before the full scale invasion, his position politically was far clearer, far clearer and less ambiguous. In fact, there was no ambiguity. He was, uh, you know, he he condemned almost everything that happened. Once people are labelled foreign agents, and then obviously they have to leave the country. There does seem to be some kind of transformation. Maybe it's the pressure of that. Maybe it's the fear that comes with it. Maybe you still need to make accommodations with the regime um, or else, you know, you'll be more aggressively targeted. But certainly the, 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 the ambiguity that you mentioned there in his positioning uh, came on through the full scale invasion. There are also other figures, of course, who were far more ambiguous prior to the invasion. Uh, I'm thinking there. Uh, like Venediktov, um, who is the uh, director of ECA, ECA Moscow. At that point, it becomes far more apparent the hybrid informational element of them. It becomes quite clear that they've made accommodations with the regime. Um, and and those become far, far easier to spot, I think, um, because this is the least morally ambiguous war and struggle since the second world war those who express any kind of ambiguity i don't know what you think there but but for me that's a clear signal that they've made some kind of accommodation with uh, with power yeah either either there is an accommodation with power or it's just like their own kind of lack of values or strength or imperialistic beliefs that they hold because of the history that they grew up with which is not the actual history that happened or the, this idea of Russian superiority. And I think um, it, it always upsets us when we see them being praised on the level that, you know, that we don't think they deserve at all. Um, but I do think that they play like a very, very clear role, as you say, like with accommodation with the regime. Um, I don't think it's like far stretched to believe that it's important for Russia to have the speakers as well. So the West, beliefs in the idea of like no 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 like they're so great Russians look at these like ordinary oppositioners like who are gonna come and do like a talk at Harvard or like talk about how much they're struggling and how much they love their country but you know it's like only Putin's war and uh, mm. it's gonna be fine after he dies and we're like no it's not there's there's, there's very few exceptions um uh, Karamurza is is in my mind maybe one exception to that Ilya Yashin, potentially. Uh, but given that it's a country of 144 million, it's extraordinary how few there are. There's also quite an interesting artist who was uh, sentenced yesterday for um, writing anti-war slogans on supermarket tickets. Um, and he, he, she came out with an extremely powerful phrase, uh, which is that, you know, I'm behind bars, but I'm freer than any of you. That is to be praised, and actually a lot of Ukrainians on Twitter have been sort of praising that. Uh, but but for me, the shocking thing is how few instances of that there are. Not that there are one or two people doing that, but that there are so few of them. That's probably yeah. a good place to pivot to Ukrainian civil society because, yes. you know, Russia I is... Uh, yeah, you were, let's, you were, you let's were talking talk. about... <laughs> you were talking about children earlier. You just mentioned that there are many cases of Ukrainian children who have been stolen, kidnapped to Russia, and who have stories of how they were resisting this uh, re-education, uh, this full-on, you know, genocidal practice of taking away thousands of children and then russifying them, trying to make sure that they hate where they come from and they become a part of Russian society and then go fight. Cause there's also like a story recently of a 16, 17 year old boy who was stolen from Ukrainian territory and is now being drafted to fight on the side of the Russian army against Ukraine like that. And I think those kids who 
come up with ways to like, you know, still resist even mentally to know, to remember where they come from, to remember why, to understand what's happening. Like obviously with, it's like mostly teenagers because when you're very, very young kid, I don't think you're like capable even to like making sense of them. But to me, they're far, 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 far braver than most of like like 99% of these Russian oppositionists who are like trying to pretend that they're they're doing something. And it's and it's Ukrainian children. Um, because when when I hear them being interviewed after like they come back and it's only like like it's only like a handful of them that were able to get returned either by their own parents or by a few Ukrainian volunteer organizations who do this kind of work because it's incredibly difficult uh, because we know that Russia claims that they took away 700,000 Ukrainian children, 700,000. It's like more than half a million. Um, I mean, Ukraine was able to identify, I think, like, and know the other, like the names, ages, and uh, who are the probably parents of uh, 20,000 of children. So like, obviously we, we don't know what's the real number, but even if it's already 20,000 that we know the identity of and others are not being able to identify because think about how many of the, those parents were killed. So nobody's looking for them. So if nobody's looking for them, how do you even know? Um, unless they have like grandparents or any other relatives and it's already far too high, obviously. And uh, the full on, horror that it's like inflicting on like thousands of Ukrainian families is unbelievable but 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 those who come back and tell stories how they were still trying to speak Ukrainian in those Russian camps trying to like uh, tell them that like no we're Ukrainian you can't tell us that we're Russian I think like far more braver for me personally and and it's it's an incredibly difficult topic but those children aren't just coming under mental pressure, some of them will be coming under physical pressure as well, uh, beatings, intimidation, and techniques to isolate them as well. Um, it must be incredibly difficult listening to those stories, um, but through those stories, do you get a sense of of the full range of sort of horror and, and treatment of them? Yeah, I think... Um... I think it's important. I don't think actually it's been highlighted enough. I know that Western media, there was a there was a Vice interview with what's her name? Lvova <gasps> Belova, this this lady of like that is like a, the Russian commissioner for children, mm -hmm. right? Somebody who basically the person behind all of this. Yeah, so, Lvova Belova, who's is sanctioned by uh, the ICC, yeah. yeah the one who's like basically a war criminal and uh, has institu institutionalized this systematic um, just, you know, abduction of children from Ukrainian territories. I mean, she's horrible, but when Vice did an interview with, with her, I think the biggest backlash that the journalist from Vice got that she didn't push back enough on her lives. Like she was like, the journalist was like, well, like people are saying you're a war criminal. And she's like, no, I'm not. And she's like, okay, let's move on to the next question. And you're like, like is this how you're like um I think like obviously interviewing those kind of people is incredibly different difficult and like we see how currently you know like there are some brilliant journalists who are really good at this kind of like work who like interviewed you know the leaders of al-Qaeda the the terrorists uh, around the world the worst kind of like dictators and criminals and it's a very, very particular skill to be able to like push back and to not to just like allow them to spit out their propaganda and their like lies through their platform, but making sure that the viewer understands the context. And I think that's where the Vice, Vice interview killed because then she started talking about how much she like loves her adopted children from Ukraine because she like adopted, like stole uh, and illegally got like two of those, like I think like boys and and. And, and like yeah, like it's it's sickening. And I, as an empathetic person myself, like I can imagine uh, myself like being like twelve or like eleven and ending up in that situation of being just like forcefully uh, taken to some other country, and suddenly it's like I can't contact my family. Like I mean, it, the trauma of that, especially for. I mean, for children, for because I know that they abducted also adults. Like that's also very important. Because in this conversation, obviously, 
we talk always about children, but there's actually also thousands and thousands of adults that Russian people just like stole either like, you know, to work in different jobs or to like do whatever. I think a man from a village nearby of mine, because he was a doctor or a medic, the Russian army stole him because they like kidnapped him because they needed, I think, a medic and nobody ever since like heard of him. So you don't know what's his fate. Um, but for children, obviously, the trauma of that is just for life. Like you will never be, you will never be able to fully heal from that, I think. And one of the techniques that I heard is that they will tell the children that all their relatives are dead, uh, whether that's true or not. They will also potentially tell them that their relatives are alive, but hate them and uh, okay. gave them up. Yeah. I mean, that that's just standard practice, I think. I think it, it almost sounds like a like very bad kind of like fairy tale that you read about like these kind of like, like a, like a scary monster or somebody like stealing you and like telling you like no your family hates you or your family's dead like now you're now you're mine I don't know like it's, it's literally like this like villain story and like in this case and I think the complicity of the Russian society in that as well is not being talked enough to because all of these camps all of these orphanage they have ordinary Russians working there there's children coming from Ukraine they're totally okay with it. The families that adopt them also knowing that they're they're lying to them about their family. Like, I mean, that's why, I mean, the whole like, idea of Putin's war is for me, it's just like not not something that I agree with. I mean, like it's not true, just not not that I'm personally don't disagree. But I know that you wanted to talk about Ukrainian civil society, so I don't want to like just because yeah. Ukrainians That's an important also. topic, though. That is a, a vital topic to talk about. I'm very glad that we, we started with that. Um, but for those who are in recently deoccupied territories and actually throughout the country, it does seem that the volunteer society, as you say, those who take initiative uh, to see a problem and solve a problem, it's not only important it's actually vital to Ukraine's survival. There are figures recently which are extraordinary. I think it was something like 50% of the frontline medical care is not provided actually by the state, but by volunteer organization. And you can extrapolate that out into many, many sectors of society. So could you give us an overview of the full scale? Yeah, I think like something that I hear a lot, like this like, question or narrative of like, oh, Ukraine gets so much like aid and help. How come like the volunteers in the civil society still need to still need to basically close so many gaps? What like, why are there, why are there so many gaps? Like, and I'm not saying that there is no no area for Ukrainian governments to to improve. There are certainly a lot, and I think um, there's a lot of great people working on um, the issues that we're currently having either in the supply chain, specifically with the medical, um, uh, tactical medicine uh, equipment uh, for soldiers, but also many other areas, um, including like the reconstruction of the country. But I think when people question that, um, especially like I get those questions from my foreign friends, um, I realized that they still didn't really understand the scale of what we're dealing with. Like they don't understand that we're fighting the biggest country in the world landwise, and also one of the most resilient economically, because not just because of the sanctions that are not working and you know all of these supplies that are helping Russia to fight this world are still ending up with uh, in Russia. Uh, but also, you know, oil fossil fuels that Russia sells, like are still boosting their economy. I mean, obviously there's a lot of conversation like, oh, like Russian economy, economy is going to fall soon. And I mean, like we don't really see that like happening on the scale that we want to or something that would like really prevent Russia from fighting. They're still, they have enough resources. They have enough money. They like, they're able to circumvent sanctions through uh, third and fourth party like companies and dealers through like you know like Iran and other other countries in this world that are friendly with Russia because of own political economic gains and are allowing them to get those supplies like in North Korea and yeah other China so the and the we're literally a very very small like country compared to that they also have the biggest like human resource that Ukraine 
Ukraine, first of all, like doesn't have as many people, like millions of people, but also doesn't want to just use our people and lose our best people because we value human life way, way more than, I mean, in Russia, I would argue there's no value for human life because there's, there's literally a poster yesterday that I saw that was like, protect life, don't like allow abortion because first you protect this child from being aborted and then this child will protect you on the front lines. And I was like, wow, that's a beautiful circle of life that you see in Russia, how they, how they, so yeah, so that's, I mean, obviously in Ukraine, in Ukraine, we're actually very, very cognizant of the fact that the best of the best are people are dying right now because they're defending us here. And, uh, and we fundraise, we uh, try to get all of the resources, supplies specifically for the military, because we know that as much as like, yes, we do get some aid from foreign countries, especially like to the military, but it's still not enough. Like the hesitation in the Western governments about like whether to supply this or that weapon, the talks, the delays, the bureaucratic processes, all of that costs lives for us. And if there is a way for volunteers and for people, I think like at this point, like I think almost every person can like call themselves a volunteer in Ukraine, at least like through my my like young circles everybody's involved in some way way or another and um people fundraise constantly i think uh right now i would probably um say that we have more fundraisers like organized fundraisers for the military specifically than we did even last year and last spring like last spring it was like more chaotic and like yes people were like fundraising for everything uh, people were he helping one another, which was great, but right now it's way more coordinated. So we, um, I think every other day there is somebody like on my, from my friends who's like fundraising for like generators for the air defense forces, because like we need them to have like electricity or somebody who's fundraising for tactical medicine for um, hospital years who are like saving uh, the soldiers. And um, there's also now this it became in a good way, like trendy to be a part of that. And I think that's also something really cool when like young people especially approach um, um, a thing like that, they always try to bring something that is more like of their generation thing. So like, I wanted to like tell you about this like really cool initiative that um, Ukrainians are currently doing for Azov because Azov, um, because of all of the years of Russian propaganda about it, um, they don't actually receive Western weapons there. I think like US actually sends a lot of weapons on the conditions that like, yes, give them to whatever you unit brigade um, you want, like, but not to Azov because there is a lot of propaganda around them and like this belief that somehow there's any like problematic people, although like they're actually one of the most productive and heroic groups in Ukrainian National Guard, then obviously their defense of Azov Stalin Mariupol is something that's like one of the biggest probably chapters of this war in history of Ukraine. And um, I and so like Ukrainian society knows that they need more help and uh, from specifically from our side, because we, we cannot expect it from like Western partners or somewhere else. Um, so, uh, these few girls from Kyiv, I think they're like all under 30, like kind of like my age, a little bit or older, um, they decided to do this, um, kind of like a movement that is called Tilovike, which means like those that are in the rear. So like, if you're like a Tilovik, you're a person that basically in the rear, but you're doing something to help people on the front lines. And, um, they basically created like an Instagram trend when where you could like create like your own like design with your picture that like I'm part of this like group. Um, I'm also like fundraising for Azov for like recently, I think they're fundraising for the armed uh, vehicles um, that are they're able to buy for M113, I think. Um, and it sort of became like a trend, like literally like everybody was trying to hop on the trend, but in a, in a great way. So they literally were able to turn something very Gen Z social media kind of thing in order to help the military. So like when you go on Instagram and everybody's posting that they're a part of that, cause they have like the similar like visual design slide and you're like, 
immediately we're like, why am I'm, why am I not part of that? I also want to be a part of that. I also want to raise either like five hundred bucks or like a thousand, couple thousand of like dollars. Like I also want to be like a part. And there is actually, and it's amazing how many people are joining. I think like now they even got like small like businesses, companies, brands, like celebrities join. So. So it is really, really amazing to see all of the creative ways Ukrainian civil society comes up with to make sure that you're like and involved and you're doing something. And um, I'm very, very proud of that personally. Like I'm very happy to see that. And that's an incredible story because I uh, the Kiev Independent covered um, a similar story uh, just this week, and it said that in total there was starting to be a drop off in the volume of uh, foreign donations, especially. And rather than being despairing, giving up and just like shrugging their shoulders, uh, it did point to this phenomenon of people being incredibly creative and innovative. That that seems to be extraordinarily Ukrainian. <laughs> the more pressure is placed, um, the more people coalesce and uh, become inventive. Um, do you do you see that phenomenon as being very much tied to uh, you know traits within Ukrainian personality? I think like obviously it is something. I think like this awakening of society and understanding that like obviously, um we're doing it first of all for ourselves like i think somebody actually because me and my friend we participated as well in this fundraiser where we're raising um two hundred thousand hymnia which is like um five five thousand five hundred uh, uh, us dollars approximately and we just closed it yesterday and like, donated it to to us off and um i think somebody asked why on this like visual when because we created like a, a design we have like our pictures and not the pictures of the soldiers. Um, and that's very interesting, actually, because it is a big, very like it, it's a big trend in Ukraine. You put your own picture there. And somebody was like, why are you centering yourself? And um, I like I actually was kind of a little bit puzzled by the question because I didn't realize that like the way people see that who are like not from Ukraine um, is very different from how we see it, because the reason why we put our own like pictures on those like little fundraising like cards like promotional materials is that because we know that first and foremost like yes we're say we're fundraising for like a zoo or we're fundraising for hospitaliers or for this and that brigade but first and foremost we're doing it for ourselves because they're there not because they want to they're there because they're protecting our life uh, they're there because of like us because and like we're here thanks to them because they're in the trenches like going through the worst and um, it is in our best interest to do everything that we can um, to help them. And I think um, it's it's quite extraordinary that like, more and more people realize that, especially young people. Um, I do know that there's always been kind of like this incredibly active part of Ukrainian civic society, I mean, for forever, but a lot of people were still like hesitant, active, and then, oh, sorry, hesitant and hesitant and not as active. And then when the Maidan revolution, the revolution of D dignity happened, sort of like more people became more active. And then obviously with like now with the full scale invasion, I think it, it's a wide reaching trend and especially um, the young people, the people who are like setting themselves in examples, like the people that like, you know, kids look up to like celebrities that used to speak Russian, play Russian songs, now they're write like funny Ukrainian songs so they can go viral because they want to fundraise. They literally create like apply their creative skills in order to fundraise. And those some of those celebrities even like worked in Russia in the past. And it's it's beautiful to see that because you know that the special young generation that looks up to them, like sees their content, right now their mindset is going to be exposed to completely different thing that versus to like what I grew up with when like a lot of these celebrities spoke Russian and still kind of propagated Russian culture in a sense so it's quite amazing and I think like obviously you, there's a joke that like what Ukrainians do the best is like like creative and design like professions and then like the programming and like tech professions and I think that's been incredibly useful in this war specifically both tech and obviously creativity and that approach to everything um, has given us a lot of advantage, obviously. 
how important is this going to be um, in the recently occupied territories, but also as more territory becomes uh, liberated? Um, and, you know, I still have the assumption that all the territories will be will be liberated. Um, how is this civic society really going to expand into those areas? Because I imagine a lot of the people in those areas are going to be uh, traumatized. They've been under occupation. They've been within a Russian information uh, ecosphere. And it, it may be tougher for these kind of civic behaviors to get going. I think um, it's important to understand that it's it's already there. Like even with this series of the occupation by Ukraine, we see that there are stories of incredible like resistance and grit and strength that those people have shown in the ways that they um, made sure that Russia feels unwelcome there. Um, the way they organized in like clandestine ways to still somehow um help either ukrainian armed forces or just like uh, help each other even like help each other to survive i think it's like it's also really important like ukrainians who were constantly like even like this old ladies that were like baking bread for like their neighbors because they had like flour and stuff like that is also like a huge act because just keeping these people alive keeping more ukrainians alive there and well and like fed um is also like crucial crucial volunteering act because we need those people alive and um and it's it's incredible to see that so it's like intergenerational and uh um i know for sure that like a lot of people obviously are like especially those who are maybe like shown their ukrainian identity or like strong position pro ukraine are more likely to be killed or tortured or um, just brought to horrible, horrible violence in those occupied territories. And obviously those who kind of, it sends a message, it sends a message to the, especially after a year and a half that like, if you display your Ukrainianness, you're going to be in danger, like your family is going to be in danger. So it's better for you to sort of like embrace, assimilate, not showing anything. And people adapt to that. And like, there, it's historically uh, been like Russian practice and and some people just become scared. Even like my grandfather and my grandparents who are, I only have like one set of grandparents alive. Uh, the other ones died before I was born and the other ones that died before I was born, they were actually way more, like way better in preserving their Ukrainian-ness and Ukrainian culture. And I'm really sad that I could never like speak to them about them, but I've heard enough about their families and their stories to also like understand who I am. But the other set of grandparents, it's also beautiful because they were part of, my grandfather specifically was a part of communist party and he always like when especially when i was young or when i was just starting my activism or when i was when i was starting to get interested in political topics he was like it's very dangerous to be that political and i'm like why we live in like a free country he's like no 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 it's better not to do this and you can see how that like soviet propaganda really is like so like he lives in a completely different state completely different society different system where it's it's completely normal people have been expressing their political wills like very successfully but he still believes that like no no it's better to not do that and i think obviously there's a lot of psychological pressure and working with those people is crucial i think i think in my opinion a lot of that work needs to be done through empathy and understanding what those people have been through um in no way you can just like judge them or make it their fault or something um, some people unfortunately take that approach like I wouldn't say the majority but if you and I don't think that it's that it's productive I think it you always need to understand what people have been through and what kind of trauma has led to maybe some of their like mm. current hesitation to express their Ukrainian identity but it's definitely something that needs to be healed through community empathy kind of this warm welcoming work rather than alienation and I think a lot of people don't quite realize that not just the current Russian regime, but throughout the Soviet Union, they came up with many, many narratives that people could then use and internalize to not be political. And they realized that not all these narratives would work with everybody. So you have to create a lot of them. Um, one of those, which I come across quite a lot because there are a lot of 
refugees uh, from Ukraine, especially from the East in Britain. I've met many, talked to many, and also traveled around Russia, of course. And, you know, one of the ingrained Russian beliefs is that we cannot be too political because then we'll have a revolution and Russian revolutions are always violent. So again, there's that, there's the threat of violence, the threat of chaos. Uh, you know, this, this might work for Ukraine, it's not going to work for us. The one that I find most extraordinary because it also seeps into the foreign propaganda is, uh, you know, what I call the conspirologia, is the idea that um, here's reality and here's news and here's everything you see, but none of it might be true, that there's some secret reason, secret world going on that will only become apparent much later. So you can't have a, you can't have a political view because the information you've got is incomplete. You're not in a position to judge it or analyze it. And there's a lot of stuff you don't know. So you don't want to look yeah. silly, you know, and, I've I've detected that uh, it's obviously very prevalent in Russia, but it's also very prevalent uh, amongst some of the people I've spoken to who are refugees. And of course, when you come to COVID conspiracies and so on, that same kind of um, disenfranchisement, this narrative works, I think, quite effectively in portions of our communities as well. Yeah, I think... Um... It is, it is very common. And uh, if you look at the like Russian disinformation tactics, it's not always like quiet to like convince you of something like of the opposite with like either your government or like your society, your community is telling. It's not like they just like have one story or one idea that they want to like convince you and like make you believe in. They just give you so many conflicting ideas, messages and like information pieces, like obviously lies, not that you're stop believing in anything because you're like, well, this looks true, but also this looks true. And this kind of also looks true. And then this, so I start questioning everything. And when I question everything and I don't have enough like critical thinking skills or like I don't have um, information sources that I trust fully, I start, I stop believing anything. And um, I think that's there. Like, I think this is something that they're doing currently because we see how Russia is weaponizing the war between Israel and Hamas currently. Uh, we see how Russia has been weaponizing and doing um, its informational warfare in Latin America and other countries in the world. I think there was a there was a report by someone recently that Russia is very, very involved in Latin America, spreading a lot of different lies and disinformation pieces. And I think that's their main tactic to not just have like one message that they want like the whole world to believe but to have so many conflicting messages um that nobody believes anything and i think a lot of those like it's a a lot of other people in this world are now like i mean we look at trump and how he and the information he says or like some other figures we can see that they're they're employing the same tactic for their own like audiences because like i mean they, they just like trust them in that case because they believe that they're right, but everybody else is wrong. And this idea as well of like, there's in, the information is incomplete because there are some people above us who are like smarter, richer, more powerful, who know, who know more than we do. Um, it's obviously such a widespread conspiracy theory narrative. Um, and it's, it's sad that people tend to believe in it and they don't believe in like, academical institutions that have like research and things and fact that backed up by years and like decades of learning and information and yeah uh, and then they literally just read one article on whatever internet source and suddenly they don't believe in anything but uh, I think unfortunately the West European Union United States were very, very unprepared and have, have allowed Russian disinformation to slip through the cracks of their different systems, like in social media networks as well. And now we see the result of that. And it's really detrimental to society. Let's turn back to volunteering. So this is this is this is the last sort of questionnaire. And more and more in these videos, I'm trying to include ideas uh, about how people can get more involved. Um there is this so-called war fatigue um it's a two-part question the first one is this seems to be more uh, a manufactured concept by mm -hmm. the western media 
and even dare say it by the political classes um because it's it's complex you know telling the truth to people it's complex finding the funds to support ukraine it's complex to retool our economies to uh produce munitions and war fatigue is a is a convenient you know get out of jail free kind of concept so that's the first part the second part of course is there are many people who are actively supporting Ukraine, whether that's supporting individual Ukrainians here, uh, or whether that is NAFO fundraising, etc. So the second part is, how can people uh, in the West who are supportive of Ukraine, who recognize the threats to their own system and values, how can they self-organize uh, and, and be more Ukrainian by fundraising and helping? Yeah, I think war fatigue is such an interesting concept because I've I've heard stories of Ukrainian like government members or activists going to like to the talks in the West or to talk like going to meet with their Western partners or going to meet Western like political leaders and being told like we're tired. And when you tell this to a Ukrainian, I mean like first of all like I mean it it, it just like mind blows me how the lack of empathy or basic like human skills people need to have um borderline intellectual skills i don't know because i cannot justify how somebody can just look at somebody from ukraine who potentially has been like not potentially most likely has been impacted firsthand probably had their family members if not like living in occupied territories maybe serving or just struggling due to everything happening and just like saying to them in the comfort of their office in like Italy or Germany or I don't know, Netherlands, that like, sorry, we're tired. I'm not saying that those countries specifically, I'm just like giving us an example. Just I know that people are very sensitive to this, but because I know that there is a lot of great people in those places and many other places who support Ukraine. Um, But I also don't really understand how that is like a justification of anything because, okay, there's war fatigue. So what do we do? Is that, is this enough of a justification to like let Putin just like swallow a country? And, and if you think like that would be okay for like the world, I mean, you're a fool probably because uh, like what kind of message it will send to other horrible people, dictators, in this world, uh, what kind of situation it will present in like international arena, and also what would it mean to other countries, either bordering Russia or, or, or just like being looked at by Russia as like a really like attractive place, and uh, because of their resources or other like Russian beliefs of like great big Russia, Russian world. I don't understand how war fatigue is, some, is something like even if it is a not. A manufactured concept even if people just generally don't have enough attention span or they just mentally tired to read the news of like constant devastation and horror and like you know these mass attacks um i can understand that but i don't think it's enough to justify not helping at least in some way especially for our like fellow european neighbors especially i think for americans who you know like have also history of this relationship with Russia, which like right now is it's either they help us or either we will have very different world where the role of the US as well in the international arena will will just like be seen as different. And um uh, like Ukrainians are also feeling tired, I think mentally more, not like physically, because um and I do see it like within Ukraine and there's the same kind of conversation that some people became like maybe more dissociated uh, they don't like look as much as the news they just kind of trying to live in their bubble enjoy their world but I, as I told you there's actually way more fundraisers where more way more these like active members who are still doing so much who are coming up with creative ways to fundraise and I don't think I think like we know that we we cannot allow ourselves to be tired because to be tired because this is something that Russia is waiting. This is Russia. This is something that Russia is hoping for, and is betting on specifically because this is only only benefits them. And while Europeans can say that like yeah we're tired, sorry, like I mean they can they can go take a break. Ukrainians, most Ukrainians actually are not able to do that. 
So because literally our life is at stake. And if if we fall, like somebody else is next and then somebody else is next. And I think people need to realize that. And you ask me how people can support. And obviously I think sharing information is like crucial, but unfortunately it's it's not probably the most like effective, impactful way if like uh, obviously those who are, are like unable to like donate or unable to like get involved in some way in 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 these like initiatives in Ukraine, um, it's okay and sharing information, just talking, just like simply even battling this like narrative of like, oh, Ukraine should give up territories, we're tired, we should stop. I think that is already helpful. If you're like, if you're at work with your friends and somebody says like, oh, I'm so tired from this war in Ukraine, I hope this stops soon and they like figure out the peace deal. Just fight that. Like even the, like you you don't need to convince the entire world, but maybe talk to your like friends, family, or whatever. Like make sure that they understand why it's important. Maybe make sure that they listen to other Ukrainians. Maybe they're just been in their information bubble and you're able to like burst that information bubble and and make because those people will be voting. Those people will be making decisions even on their own political level in their own countries. But that will always help implications for Ukraine probably as well. And it's important that kind of like people understand that. So that's like the bare minimum, I think. And, but that is already helpful. If you want to get like involved in like more and bring impact on the ground, I think obviously donating to Ukrainians, to Ukrainian led fundraisers. I think there's a lot of conversation right now with like foreign organizations versus Ukrainian. And I always obviously advocate to, unless you really, really trust and know that this like foreign organization is like making impact on the ground, which they're a lot and they're great. A lot of them are like smaller, but unfortunately we've seen a lot of foreign organizations also being like ineffective, not really bringing real amp impact, but getting the money and then just expending them on something that is not really gonna make a difference or just overall spending them on their own administrative expenses. So um, so obviously Ukrainian fundraisers, especially if you know, um, I tell people either to like, if they follow somebody from Ukraine and they know that they do important social work, that just like always support them, just sending even a dollar or two to whatever thing they're fundraising and they're probably fundraising a lot. It, it goes such a long way. Like I have a few people in my audience on Instagram that constantly donate even like $5 whenever I do a fundraiser. And it's honestly amazing because if every single person who watches my content every day donates like $2, which is honestly for, more peop more, for most people not gonna change their financial situation, it's gonna help me like close those fundraisers in like a few days because because then it's, it's just gonna be fast and productive. So I think like people really, underestimate the value of even of this like, consistency i think being consistent is the best like you can do little but be consistent with your support and it will go longer way than just like you burning out fully right now and then saying that you're tired and forgetting and not doing anything so so obviously that's kind of like my view i think like there's a lot of tips and different things but um uh, yeah, if you have a way to engage with Ukrainian culture in your place, do that as well. But uh, obviously we need help to our armed forces the most. I think that's incredibly important. Tourniquets, armoured vehicles, uh, other vehicles for the front, um, and of course drones. I mean, people don't want to um, contribute to uh, weaponry that's going to kill Russians, let's be frank. Um, then they can contribute to medical supplies, food aid, camo netting. There's, there's plenty of things. We're gonna share links in the description of the video uh to some of your sort of recommended causes uh, and i strongly recommend people check those out it's been a huge huge pleasure speaking to you again on the channel um it was fabulous meeting with you and the other speakers as well in lviv i hope that uh, we get to do that again and um thanks so much for for everything you do yeah thank you so much for inviting me it's such a pleasure to always talk to you and thank you for your very active and uh, just incredible viewers who keep supporting Ukraine and keep learning more and more from Ukrainians themselves. Thank you. Slava Ukraine. Haram Slava.